Dr. Carrie Doherty, MD. Dr. Doherty is an Associate Professor of Neurology and Program Director of the Med Headache Medicine Fellowship at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, DC. She received her medical degree from Indiana University School of Medicine, followed by an internship at North Shore University Health System in Evanston, Illinois. Dr. Doherty completed her neurology residency at Georgetown University Medical Center in Washington, DC, followed by a fellowship in headache medicine at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, PA. She is board certified in neurology with a subspecialty certification in headache medicine. Dr. Doherty is a fellow of the American Headache Society and serves as a member of the Guidelines Committee and the Scottsdale Headache Symposium Planning Committee. She is also a 2019 graduate of the AHS Emerging Leaders Program. She is secretary of both the Southern Headache Society and the Alliance for Headache Disorders Advocacy. She is committed to improving the lives of her patients through her clinical work, as well as education and advocacy. Wow, totally amazing credentials, uh, Dr. Doherty. Please take it away. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that warm welcome. And thank you for everybody joining us today from home. Um, my, Miles for Migraine has really blossomed during my career as a headache specialist and meets a really remarkable unmet need in providing community amongst migraine patients who previously really didn't have a way to engage, advocate, and learn as a group um, other than you know through their providers. And I really appreciate everything that Miles for Migraine does, both for my patients um, and for migraine education in general. So I'm delighted to be here today virtually. I have to say that last year when we did a patient education day in person at Georgetown, we were in a small room that was a little bit overheated. So you probably appreciate being in the comfort of your own home today, um, as do I, unless my children make an appearance and we will accommodate accordingly. My husband's doing uh, defense on all the doors. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, with that, I'm gonna get started on my talk today and I'm gonna do the logistics of sharing my screen, which is here, share, and I'm gonna go on the presenter. Oh, I don't need a second, we gotta start at the beginning. All right. So the title of my talk today is What is CGRP? Um, and that was uh, the title and the topic are chosen by Miles for Migraine uh, participants and educators really as something that obviously is of interest to you and, and particularly relevant to the treatment field that we have now that's available for our migraine patients. Um, and it's a, a new concept to be treating CGRP for those of you who have had migraine for years and years. Um, so I want to give an opportunity and give a high level overview and not get super sciencey, but just so you have a basic understanding of what CGRP is other than a whole bunch of jumbled letters that don't mean anything other than it's a new treatment available for you or a target for some of the treatments that you're seeing or talking about with your provider. Um, talk about its role in migraine, give you some historical perspective on how it's evolved um, and become really the focus of treatment in migraine, and then talk about logistically what are the options now in the field of migraine medicine that target CGRP. Um, how do they work? How are they different? And then we'll get into some questions and hopefully some answers. So important slide to talk about is my disclosures because they are relevant to the subject that uh, we have at hand today. I do do consulting work for all of the pharmaceutical companies that manufacture these medications. I've highlighted the ones that I think are relevant here and I've tried to give you as unbiased a presentation today but I would keep that in mind. So our outline, CGRP, the basics, talking about the role in migraine that CGR play that CGRP plays, as well as how the medications that we have available now work on CGRP. And we're gonna talk about new meds that you know work on CGRP because that's the way that they're advertised and discussed. But we're also gonna talk about some tried and true medications that you're probably already familiar with but may not have known that they also um, act on CGRP. And as I said, we're gonna do question and answers. I know you have questions. Hopefully I have some answers. I won't tell you that I have all of them, um, but I will do my best with what we've got. So CGRP, uh, it's a neuropeptide, and CGRP stands for calcitonin gene-related peptide, um, which if you're in marketing, isn't that great of a name to sell anyone on because calcitonin really isn't involved in migraine at all. It just looks like the calcitonin gene, um, and it has like a similar blue blueprint. So that's how it gets its name, and it's a little bit of alphabet soup. 
If you ask your provider what is CGRP, they're likely to tell you that it's a neuropeptide, and that may also not mean very much. But if you break down the word, you know, neuro, it's released from neurons in your brain. Um, it's also released by nerves and neurons outside of the brain. So it both works. Uh, CGRP is involved in the pathophysiology of migraine, both inside the brain, what we call the central ner nervous system, and then also outside the brain in the peripheral nervous system. So it's really ubiquitous um, within you know, nerve sing signaling. And neuropeptide just means that it's a protein and it's involved in signaling uh, in the brain. What do we know about what CGRP does? Our understanding of the main function of CGP CGRP are listed here on the right. We know that it is involved in the regulation of blood flow and is a potent vasodilator, which means it relaxes blood vessels and makes them larger to increase blood flow. We also know that it's involved in neurogenic inflammation and mediates the sensory perception of pain. The best explanation that I can give for patients here that you may be familiar with is capsaicin or what makes um, hot peppers really painful when you get them on their skin, on your skin. That reaction where if you get, um, like if you're cutting hot peppers and you get it on your skin and your skin is burning and red and inflamed, that's a nerve sensation causing inflammation. And that action is actually mediated by CGRP. And we call that neurogenic inflammation. And neurogenic inflammation is also involved in migraine pathophysiology. We also know that CGRP does have a role in your immunity. It's both pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory, um, and it has a balance in that system. Let me try to advance my slides. All right, so the history of CGRP in migraine. So you may have had migraine for 30 or 40 years, and up until the last two or three, never heard about CGRP, was never discussed in any visit. So you think to yourself, where does this come from? What is this newfangled explanation for what's causing my migraines? CGRP was initially discovered in 1983, so in the early 80s, by a researcher who wasn't doing research on migraine. He was looking at what neuropeptides were involved in regulating blood flow in the brain and was looking at a number of different things and discovered that CGRP was involved in what we call reactive vasodilation. So in situations of stress, CGRP causes the blood vessels to increase in size and increase blood flow. So that was the initial discovery. Um, and then subsequently later in the 80s, researchers who were focused on migraine realized that CGRP was released by the trigeminal nerve. And the trigeminal nerve is involved in sensation of your face. We call it the trigeminal nerve because it has three branches, one that goes behind the eye, one that goes across the face, and one that goes down into the jaw. And the peripheral branches um, may be where you have pain and migraine. If you do this during a migraine, that's your supraorbital and supratrochlear nerve that are getting irritated. And those are branches of the trigeminal nerve. So in the late 1980s, they realized that if they stimulated the trigeminal nerve, CGRP was released. And that was really the initial research that gave them the inclination that CGRP would have a role in migraine pathophysiology and pain. Later, in the early 1990s, it was discovered that during a migraine attack, CGRP levels in the blood were elevated. And you can see we have a big gap here from 1990 to 2008. And in 2008, with this knowledge that CGRP was involved in migraine pathophysiology, the first medication, um, the first medication that was an oral med that had essentially broader application for migraine treatment showed promise in clinical trials as being an acute medication. So the G-PANTS, which we're going to talk about later on in detail in terms of what's available now, the G-PANTS actually came about before the monoclonal antibodies, which is different than what you may have experienced in that you talked about monoclonal antibodies for migraine treatment the first one released in 19, uh, 2018, and then G-Pants just recently. But G-Pants were actually around as far as 2008. So that initial one showed promise. It was as effective as a triptan in treating a migraine acutely. Now the research continued, and in 2010 they showed that an infusion of CGRP in patients who had migraine with and without aura mm -hmm. would provoke a migraine-like headache further supporting the idea that CGRP is playing a role. 
So the research with telcagipan continued, and in 2014, <laughs> based on the initial study, showed that telcagipan may have had benefit as a preventive. So they went looking a little bit more, saying, if you take telcagipan on a daily basis, does it reduce migraine frequency? Does it have preventive efficacy? Unfortunately, this trial was stopped because some patients had adverse effects where um, they had abnormalities in their liver function, and that was of concern. And for that reason, the company that was developing telcagipant decided that they didn't want to do migraine research anymore because they didn't really think that this drug was going to be marketable. So they stopped their research program. They had a whole bunch of medications that were also GPANTs that were in development, and they decided that they weren't going to invest anymore in it and, and said, you know, these medications or these compounds at that point in time, um, we're not going to bring to market. And they sold them off to different pharmaceutical companies who did further research. So the question was, if you target CGRP and you get benefit, but the small molecules maybe had these adverse events, what's another way to be able to target CGRP? And that was the development of antibodies, another totally different kind of mechanism for binding to CGRP with a big molecule, um, but showed promise. And so, as you saw in clinical practice, in 2018, the first CGRP-targeted monoclonal antibody um, was approved for prevention. Those molecules didn't go away, though. Other companies continued to do research and found out that it wasn't anything about G-pants that caused those abnormalities of those patients' liver functions. It was just that specific molecule. So there were others that were in development that binded it a little bit differently that they were able to evaluate further and now are coming to market. So just recently, in 2020, there was the approval of one and then two G-pants that are now approved for acute treatment of migraine. And it's likely in the future, so I'm estimating here and no one can hold me to these dates, but we estimate that in 2022 or sometime around there, that GPANTS will next be evaluated um, and shown to be effective and hopefully FDA approved for use as preventive options for migraine. So I hope that gives you a little bit more perspective on where CGRP came from and kind of how the landscape of treatments for CGRP um, in migraine have evolved over time. So CGRP and migraine, what do we know about what CGRP does in migraine? So as I said, the CGRP levels increase during an acute migraine in the blood levels. We also know that triptans, which are used as acute treatment for migraine, reduce CGRP levels. And the amount that they reduce your CGRP level actually corresponds to how well they help your migraine. We also know that CGRP in patients or persons who have chronic migraine is increased all the time. Even when they don't have migraine, their CGRP levels are elevated when you compare it to patients who have either lower frequency migraine or patients who don't have migraine at all. This is interesting because the degree of CGRP elevation predicts who responds to onobotulinum toxin, which we colloquially refer to as Botox as the brand name. So all of this providing further support, both that CGRP is involved in migraine and that medications that we've been using for a while actually affect CGRP, and that may explain some of the reason that they work. Now, this is my one major science -y slide, so I want you to bear with me. I'm going to try to go through it slowly. I explained it to my husband last night, who is not medical, and he said he got it and wasn't overwhelmed. And I know that many of you are more than capable. Um, I have patients that are neuroscientists who probably work like diagrams on this on a regular basis. Um, but for those of you who aren't interested, I think it's still going to be helpful. So I have a diagram here that shows you the trigeminal nerve, so just one little nerve fiber that comes out. Um, and then, the, so if that nerve is acting on another nerve, I have what's called at the bottom the postjunctional cell. So this is a pain signal coming down the trigeminal nerve. That nerve is activated. It's releasing CGRP to act on the next. In the yellow, you can see the CGRP receptor on the gray postjunctional cell. So that's the signal transmission of pain. If you think of CGRP as kind of perpetuating that pain and neurogenic inflammation, this is the mechanism that it does it. There are also CGRP receptors on smooth muscle cells on the outside of arteries, because um, I told you that CGRP is involved in relaxing or vasodilating blood vessels and making them larger. And so it also, in addition to working on nerves, can work on blood vessels. I've also shown you here serotonin receptors. Serotonin receptors are important because if you activate a serotonin receptor, 
it inhibits CGRP release. And the medications that you have right now may be acting that. So I have 5-HT, 1-B and 1-D, which is, I realized totally alphabet soup, um, but the 1-B and 1-D is what tryptans bind to. So tryptans act on, it's shown here in, let's see what color this is gonna be. We're gonna call it aqua or turquoise. Tryptans activate serotonin receptors and inhibit CGRP release. Tryptans also act on the serotonin receptor 5-HT1B that's on blood vessels. And one of the possibly negative consequences of this is that that can cause vasoconstriction. And this is the reason that in patients who have elevated blood pressure or who may have cardiovascular disease, we may shy away from using tryptans because of a concern for this as an unwanted side effect. There is a new class of medication that also works on serotonin receptors, and we call that DITANS. Um, the one that's on market right now is Lasmitidan, the brand name of which is Raybow, and it works on 5-HT1F, which is just a different serotonin receptor. And what's important about that is that serotonin receptor is not on blood vessels, so you don't have that unwanted side effect of vasoconstriction. All right, other things that we have in our armamentarium for treating migraine. The new medications that are GPANTS, these small molecules that are oral and approved right now for acute treatment of migraine, they bind to the CGRP receptor. They don't activate it. All they do is block it. Um, sometimes we talk about a lock and key, but the better analogy here is actually this is like putting a key in and breaking it off. You're not turning it. You're not opening the door. You're just saying nobody else here can enter. And that's what the G-pants do. And so you can see how they work on both the post-junctional shell as well as the, um, the smooth muscle cell outside of arteries. However, that action, because it doesn't activate CGRP, is thought that it doesn't have any consequences in terms of vasoconstriction or any other change in kind of the, the, the tone um, of blood vessels. Next, you have monoclonal antibodies, which either bind to CGRP so that it can't interact with its receptor, or they bind directly to the CGRP receptor so that the little blue circle here, that CGRP um, in this neuron junction, can't bind to it, the receptor. So it occupies that space, and they're approved, as you're aware, for preventive treatment of migraine. Now, you may be familiar with uh, onobotulinum toxin, which also inhibits CGRP release because it binds right here um, in the circle, so in the orange, where the CGRP vesicle is getting released in that space. And because it binds, that vesicle can't dock and can't release the information, including CGRP, that it has inside of it. So I hope I haven't... Um, turned you off to the science of migraine. I hope I, that you have a little bit of a better understanding of how the medications that are available or that you may be using are working in migraine um, and how they're acting on CGRP. Now I'll tell you, this is an oversimplification of migraine pathophysiology. And I'm telling you a story here where CGRP is the main player, but your personal experience may tell you that CGRP is not all that there is to migraine and you're totally accurate. I just want you to understand how CGRP is involved in the current medications that we have. So what do we have available to us? CGRP monoclonal antibodies are indicated in the preventive treatment of migraine. There are four that are currently on the market. And I have a diagram or a table here that shows you what the subtle differences are between them. Um, Arenumab or Amivig in the first column binds to the CGRP receptor. It's unique in that way. It's the only one of the four that are on the market that binds to the CGRP receptor and not, so the next word I have over here in the next column is ligand, and that just means that you're binding to CGRP directly. The next three bind to the ligand. Arenumab, galcanizumab, and freminizumab, and I have the brand names below for your familiarity, are all available in either an auto injector for subcutaneous injection. If you don't really love using an auto injector, um, galcanizumab and frenizumab, if you ask for it, and actually uh, frenizumab goes the opposite way, are also available in a pre filled syringe. Um, Reminizumab or a Jovi came out in the pre-filled syringe first, which is essentially, it just looks like a needle with the medication in it, and that's how you get it, and you have to push the plunger. Some people like that, some people do not like that. But you have the option in those two medications in choosing. 
Viapti is not a subcutaneous injection. It's the newest of these four, and it's an intravenous infusion that's administered um, either in a provider's office or in an infusion center. It takes about a half an hour. The dosing regimen for these medications are a little bit different depending on which one. So for arenumab, it comes in two doses, 70 or 140 milligrams, and you give that dose that you've chosen every month, and your provider may choose one or the other or may have you change doses depending on your experience. Galcanizumab comes first as a loading dose where you get a bigger amount on the first injection, which is two injections, and then one injection every month thereafter. Feminizumab comes in two dosing regimens. You can either do one injection once a month or you can do three injections, which ends up being 675 milligrams quarterly or every three months. Eptinizumab is also administered. Oh, there is an error on my slide, so this is not true. It's administered quarterly, so 100 or 300 milligrams every three months, not monthly. Side effects. So there are different side effects depending on each one. The first three that are injections, arenumab, galcanizumab, feminizumab, all have injection site reaction. Hypersensitivity reactions occurred with arenumab and galcanizumab. Arenumab also has constipation, which was noted more at the higher doses. I have what's called post-marketing information here at the end. So after it, so the initial discussion of side effects that I have listed without the asterisks, that's what happened in the clinical trials. So in a placebo-controlled clinical trial, what side effects did patients who were on the investigational medication experience either 2% or greater of patients or more than who were on the placebo? So if you compare it to those that got the placebo, what side effects did they experience with the higher frequency? And those are the initial ones that are listed. After a medication comes to market, there's often a discussion about what other side effects patients may experience because we know that we don't capture every patient's experience in just one clinical trial. So post-marketing reports um, for arenumab, which has been on the market the longest, it was approved in May of 2018, so just two years, um, actually just this month. After that, there were two updates. One was that some patients had constipation that was so severe, they had serious complications. It was more likely to occur in patients who either had constipation to begin with or had some other medication that they were on that would, might predispose to having constipation. The other that's more recent is that some patients, typically those that had risk factors for high blood pressure or um, patients who were newly put on arenumab, could have serious high blood pressure. So those are the two additional side effects that have now been added to what's called the label or what the FDA kind of lists in terms of possibilities that occur with this medication. I haven't talked about the newest one. So eptinizumab has two side effects. One is um, nasopharyngitis, so essentially a runny nose. This actually didn't occur more frequently than those who had placebo, but because it occurred in 6%, so greater than 2%, it is on the label. Um, just because it's on the label doesn't necessarily mean that we think it's mechanistic or related to how the med works. Um, it may be just you know, a consequence of how they did the clinical trial and what time of year and whether a lot of people got nasopharyngitis. Hypersensitivity reactions or serious um, kind of anaphylaxis is also reported. All right, so that was monoclonal antibodies. The other category that works on CGRP are G pants, and they are indicated for acute treatment. I have a migraine, what am I going to use? Um, what you might be familiar with prior to this is triptans are probably the most commonly prescribed migraine specific acute treatment, and now we have this new category as well as ditans, which I did not talk about today, um, just because we're focused on CGRP. So the two on the market are Ubrojapant and Remedjapan. Ubrojapant comes in two doses, Remedjapan in one. Ubrojapant's a tablet, Remedjapant's an oral disintegrating tablet. Ubrojapant, you can take similarly to how you take a triptan, where you take one at onset, and if you still have bad migraine, um, you can take another in two hours. Remedjapant lasts 24 hours, so it's only one tablet in a day. They both are metabolized by the liver um, by a specific enzyme called CYP3A4. This is relevant because when medications are all metabolized by the same enzyme in the liver, sometimes one may increase the metabolism or decrease the 
metabolism of another. I put some uh, that are most common. So the most common interactions are between antifungals or antibiotics. And luckily your pharmacist runs that and will counsel you as such. The ones that may be a little bit more relevant for migraine patients are verapamil, um, which is used sometimes as a migraine preventive. And then, then barbiturates, butalbital is the barbiturate that's in Fioracet or um, Fiorinol. So those are relevant. It's the same for both Ubrojapant and Remedjapan in terms of that interaction. The side effects for Ubrojapant were nausea and sleepiness at rates of two to 4% and fairly similar to placebo and then nausea and Remedjapant. All right, so that's the overview of medications that are available currently. So can I get my CGRP less levels tested? After I give this discussion, and I have a very similar discussion that I give to primary care and I give to general neurology, um, and when I talk about elevated CGRP levels or interventions that reduce CGRP levels, the first question that I get in the back is, okay, how do I get my patients tested for CGRP? What lab is sending it? And I would love to tell you that that was an available option, but unfortunately, it's not. CGRP is very rapidly metabolized in the body. Its half-life, which is the amount of time it takes for the level to drop in half, is only seven minutes. So if you've ever been waited in line at LabCorp um, for your blood to get drawn, it's probably the time that you take to the register that your CGRP levels are dropping, dropping, dropping. The most accurate way to get a CGRP level is actually the picture that I showed here, which means it's a stick in the neck. Um, it's a jugular stick, uh, which is not a low risk procedure in the big scheme of things. So if you were gonna get an accurate, that's the external jugular is where you would get the blood sample, which is not readily available at any lab facility that I know of. The other is that there's no company right now that offers a commercially available test, probably for the aforementioned reasons. So unless you have a lab where you're actually studying CGRP, no one can kind of order this test routinely. Um, so unfortunately, no, you can't get your CGRP levels tested in clinical practice. Another question that's commonly addressed is, okay, so you went through what CGRP does in migraine. What does CGRP do elsewhere in the body? And the truth is that CGRP does a lot more. I talked about how it was involved in vasodilation, in the immune system, and in neurogenic inflammation and pain signaling. But there are CGRP receptors throughout the body, and they're in a lot, involved in a lot of different places. And this is not an exhaustive list. This is just things that I thought might be interesting or relevant, um, either to side effect profiles that, you may, um, that we talked about previously or that you may have read about. So it's involved in bone formation and resorption. It's involved in gastrointestinal motility. And so I did mention that one of the CGRPs, Arenumab, has a side effect profile of um, constipation, and that's probably related um, to how CGRP works in the gut. There's also CGRP um, release from hair follicles. CGRP receptors are, and this is not the only place that CGRP receptors are, but they're in the uterus and the placenta. Um, and so that's part of the reason, in addition to the fact that there's no safety data that we don't typically use CGRP receptors or they're not indicated for use in pregnancy or nursing. They've not been studied um, and we are concerned that they have a role. And it's a medication that lasts for a long time in your body since they're only dosed once a month, a conversation that we often have with patients who are planning for conception or family planning, um, is that if you wanted to discontinue this, these medications, it takes about five months for the medication to completely be out of your system. CGRP receptors are also in the penis, semen, and prostate. So we know that migraine affects men too, and this may be relevant for them. We don't know. CGRP levels are increased in arthritis and obesity, and they are decreased in diabetes and heart disease. So CGRP has a lot um, of roles in the body. Another question that I think is related to the first is side effects. How are side effects determined? So when I went through the side effects, I explained that in a clinical trial, the side effects that are reported are what occurs greater than placebo or at a frequency of 2% or more. And that's what gets put on the label. So that doesn't necessarily encompass an exhaustive list. And so that's why we often rely on post-marketing report. After a medication has been evaluated in a clinical trial and it comes out and you know, anybody can use it, 
then we start to collect more information. Now, that information is a little bit harder to sort through because you're not in this idealized situation of a clinical trial where you can say, you know, you're on placebo, you're on active medication. That's the only difference between you two. And this is, I think, related to the medication. Real life is much more complicated and it can be difficult to determine what's causal um, and what's just uh, coincidental. So if you have a side effect that's not listed, the first thing you wanna do is obvious. You wanna to talk to your doctor about it, about whether or not they've seen it or heard of it from other patients, um, whether or not they have an opinion on whether it can be related, how serious it is. Sometimes with patients, there's a discussion about risk versus benefit, and also how would we be able to determine whether or not that side effect is related to the medication. I often counsel patients for something that I haven't experienced or I'm not sure about to say, well, if it's not that serious, maybe let's stop the medication, see if it gets better, and then re-challenge. And if it happens again, then we have a little bit more confidence that it's related. But that's a long process, and so that's why it's a conversation with your provider. If you have negative side effects, one of the ways that you can both, you know, kind of get more information out there is to report your negative side effects to the FDA. And you can do that through the website um, I've listed here for MedWatch, or you can call them. You can also call the manufacturer the manufacturer of the medication, and they can kind of help you navigate that process. You can do it in concert with your physician. I will tell you that for patients for whom I've done that, it requires a lot of information because they kind of want to know all the variables that contribute. Um, and so it's a lot to kind of put that in there, but it does give us more information about these newer medications. All right, a couple other questions that I think um, you may have. I've tried one CGRP antibody should maybe, but it didn't work, or I had side effects, should I maybe consider trying another? Or I've tried two, should I try a th third? I've tried three, should I try a fourth? So depending on your situation, if the reason, so you tried them and they didn't work for you, the medications are different. And we talked about how they act different. The clinical trial information is different. I do think in many situations, it is worthwhile. Is there any guarantee or predictive information that we have out there to kind of guide that decision? No, not really. If you have side effects, it's a different conversation. Um, it depends on how serious the side effects were and whether the medication that you're considering switching to has the same side effect if they have overlapping ingredients. Um, all of the contraindications to these meds will include an allergic reaction to what's called excipients, which is other stuff in the injection. And you have to find the really small fine print in the package insert to find out what those other things are and whether they're similar between two of the different um, solutions. And for patient populations for whom these medications didn't work, um, clinical trials do not capture real world experience. As a headache specialist at a tertiary headache center, I'll tell you that we have difficulty recruiting from our own practice into the um, clinical trials because our patients are complicated and they have so many things going on and that may be you. So the clinical trial information may not represent your experience. Migraine is complicated and CGRP is certainly not the whole story. And I stole a graphic um, from the internet that I thought really captured that. So you've heard the parable of six blind men, although here we have men and women, evaluating an elephant and they all have a different impression about what it is and they're not seeing the forest for the trees. So if our, and I love that this elephant is purple. So we have our purple migraine elephant here. Um, and this lady down in front with an injection um, says it's CGRP. But, you know, your experience may be that it's hormonal, that it's inflammation, that it's cortical spreading depression, which is kind of what happens in migraine with aura and is a totally different kind of pathophysiology of migraine. Um, you may have heard over the years that it has to do with vascular. And certainly we talked about today about how CGRP is kind of involved in vasodilation and, and blood vessels or its diet. It is a lot of different things and they're not even all captured here. Um, so CGRP is new and there are treatments that are focused on it, but it's not all that's migraine. Um, and, un and luckily there are a lot of other medications that are in development in the pipeline that address other factors that we think are involved in migraine pathophysiology. So I think the future is very bright, although I realize that telling a bunch of migraine patients and persons with migraine um, that something is bright makes them all want to put their shades on. And we have shades for migraine coming up in June for Migraine Awareness Month. But the future is really promising for what it holds. Um, Miles for Migraine certainly represents how exciting it is to be in migraine right now. This is my, I have a group here 
that does Headache on the Hill. These are my migraine warriors that stomp with me on the hill every year. And they are some remarkable women who really are advocating for better treatments, more funding for research, better access. Katie's going to talk about, you know, social security, disability, all things that people active in migraine and advocates are, are working towards. This is my team up on the right, um, right hand corner. I'm a neurologist, so I have right left confusion. And so on my right, uh, Dr. Alani, our nurse practitioners, Laura Zanders and Julia Salishmas, who are, you know, my family and who make this happen and who are constantly an inspiration. And then the reason that we do this, which is the next generation of migraines. So you can see these little migraine warriors here. Uh, the two of them on the right are mine and then um, their best friend, you know, all of whom had ge a genetic predisposition toward migraine. And so that's the reason that we do this. And then I have Sadie who thinks that her miles for migraine um, neck gaiter is a skirt. But I really appreciate your time and attention. And now I'm going to open up for questions. Thanks, Dr. Doherty. That was great. Um, we're running a little bit behind on time, and you actually answered a lot of the questions in your presentation, which was awesome. Um, I'm, I'm thinking the best question to ask you may be, um, it seems like, you know, there's a lot of confusion between the different CGRP blockers, and I'm wondering, is there any guidance on which one to start first and or, you know, wh when to try a second one, a third one? So I'm going to flip back to that slide. Um, I will tell you that in my clinic, it's a discussion where we present, I would say the first three that you can administer at home. Those are usually what we're starting with, um, just in terms of logistics and access. And then we have a conversation with a patient about side effect profiles. Uh, certainly side effect profiles often dictate our choices of preventive in migraine. So if someone has a pre-existing concern, especially about something like constipation, we maybe choose one of the other one. The others in terms of experience, if you think about if you've tried um, a preventive antibody that works on binding to CGRP, certainly in our mind, we think that where CGRP is released and where the receptors sit are different places in the nervous system. And so that it may behoove someone from to switch from one that binds to the ligand to one that binds to the receptor or vice versa. We don't have a lot of clinical experience with the intravenous infusion because it was approved just in April in the beginning of, you know, or in the middle of the COVID pandemic. So I would say our experience and probably the requirements of insurance prior authorizations is that it's going to be the next choice um, after someone's tried one of the subcutaneous injections. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I think we need to move on. I'm sorry, we could probably talk about this all day. <laughs> Thanks so much for your attention. I appreciate it. I'm going to turn it over to Migraine Warrior, 